Hey everyone, I'm Jason, and this is your commentary on Exodus chapter 23. Do not spread reports that are false. Do not help an evil person by telling lies in court. Do not follow the crowd when they do what is wrong. When you are a witness in court, do not turn what is right into wrong. Do not go along with the crowd. Do not show favor to a poor person in court. This doesn't mean that we can't be fair to poor people in court. It says, just because someone's poor, you shouldn't lie in order to make the situation a little bit better. It says, be fair, regardless. Suppose you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering away. Then be sure to take it back to him. Suppose you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has fallen down under its load. Then do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. This is just part of the golden rule, doing unto others as we want them to do unto us. For this part, if you see someone's animal, or any possession belonging to someone that doesn't like you or that you don't like, don't take it out on that object or that animal or anything else, just because of your feelings towards the person who owns it. Be fair to your poor people in their court cases. Do not have anything to do with a charge that is false. Do not put to death those who are not guilty of doing anything wrong. I will not let those who are guilty go free. Do not take money from people who want special favors. It makes you blind to the truth. It twists the words of godly people. Do not beat an outsider down. You yourselves know how it feels to be outsiders. Remember, you were outsiders in Egypt. For six years, plant your fields and gather your crops. But during the seventh year, do not plow your land or use it. Then the poor people who are among you can get food from it. The wild animals can eat what is left over. Do the same thing with your vineyards and your groves of olive trees. And this might seem a little bit odd to go six years of producing fruit and then in the seventh year not doing that. It's actually a rotation that they would do between their fields. Now, in the seventh year, although they wouldn't plant anything, there would still be some product that would grow up. The poor people were allowed to eat it. The animals were allowed to eat it. It's actually wise to do this, not only for economical purposes for other people, but just for your land. It gives your land time to rebuild its own nutrients. Do all of your work in six days, but do not do any work on the seventh day. Then your oxen and donkeys can rest. The slaves who are born in your house can be renewed, and so can the outsiders. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not use the names of other gods. Do not even let them be heard on your lips. Now, so far, all of these things actually relate back to one or more of the Ten Commandments. It's just helping to flesh it out a little bit more what it really means to obey the commandments that God has given. Three times a year, you must celebrate a feast in my honor. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Eat bread that is made without yeast for seven days, just as I commanded you. Do it at the appointed time in the month of Abib. You came out of Egypt in that month. You must not come to worship me with your hands empty. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it follows the Passover. During the Passover, when they were still in Egypt, they sacrificed the lamb, they put the lamb's blood on the doorpost, and then the angel of death would pass over that house. So they were protected by the blood of the lamb. Now they were in such a hurry to get out of Egypt right after that occurred that they couldn't take any bread that had yeast in it because that would re require time for it to rise. In the Bible, yeast is also a symbol of sin because once it gets in, it spreads all over. There's no way to cut it back out. Celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Bring the first share of your crops from your field. Now, later on, we learn more about the Feast of Weeks. It was actually seven weeks and one day. So it would be a 50-day period altogether. Specifically, it was the 50 days following the Passover because it took them 50 days to leave Egypt and to get up to Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai, they got to see some of God's glory come down, and he gave them the law. In the New Testament, 
we have something very similar. 50, or in Greek, would actually be pente. So we have Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Passover. In the Passover, that's the time when Jesus was sacrificed. He died. He rose again. Fifty days later, that's when the Holy Spirit came down to the disciples. Celebrate the Feast of Booths. Hold it in the fall when you gather in your crops from the field. The Feast of Booths, they would, even Orthodox Jews today, would sleep in like a little tent. That's where they would live, outside of their house, and as a way to remember a couple of things. One, they're waiting for the giving of the law. They're supposed to make yourself holy or declare yourself that you're going to be holy at that point in time. The other one is because they left Egypt in such a hurry, and also we get later on about the wandering around, that it meant that your home is not here, that you're just passing through this land awaiting to get to the promised land. That was a way to remember God's promise of deliverance and holiness for you. Three times a year, all of your men must come to worship me. I am your Lord and King. Do not include anything that is made with yeast when you offer me the blood of a sacrifice. Again, because yeast was a symbol of sin. Suppose the fat from sacrifices is left over from my feast. Then do not keep it until morning. Bring the best of the first share of your crops to my house. I am the Lord your God. Now when he says here, don't leave the fat left over. The fat was the best part. And so sometimes you would have to eat it, which has made the food even better. It was a way to remember that God was really going to bless people. With any of the sacrifices, it was something you wanted to take seriously. You didn't want to leave it over. So if you had any left, then they would typically burn it so that we wouldn't be there in the morning. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, even today, some of the more Orthodox Jews won't use milk cream with their meats. Uh, they won't cook with their meats when, uh, with the milk at all. Here, it can mean a couple of different things. Culturally, there were other cultures that would worship fertility gods. And part of their worship would be to cook an animal in the milk from its mother. Now, even if we're not going to go with worshipping other gods, especially fertility gods, there is something unnatural about a baby being boiled in its mother's own milk. I am sending an angel ahead of you. He will guide you along the way. He will bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him. Listen to what he says. Do not refuse to obey him. He will not forgive you if you turn against him. My very name is in him. Listen carefully to what he says. Do everything I say. Then I will be an enemy to your enemies. I will fight against those who fight against you. Now, the word angel here, it's a matter of translation. There's angel, ah, like the cherubim. But really, angel, the word just means a messenger. Someone who is, spit, who is sent and speaks on behalf of someone else. This very likely could have been Christ himself come down in a form that led them into the promised land. This was the case when there was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. A number of times this would occur. In other passages, an angel would have been one of the prophets who would speak on God's behalf to help lead them. He would be a messenger for God. So just because it says angel, it doesn't mean the halo and the wings and everything else. It just means a messenger. My angel will go ahead of you. He will bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites. I will wipe them out. Do not do what they do. Do not bow down to their gods or worship them. You must destroy the statues of their gods. You must break their sacred stones to pieces. I am the Lord your God. Worship me. Then I will bless your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. In your land, no woman will give birth to a dead baby. Every woman will be able to have children. I will give you a long life. I will send my terror ahead of you. I will throw every nation you meet into a panic. 
I will make all of your enemies turn their backs and run away. I will send hornets ahead of you. They will drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in just one year. If I did, the land would be deserted. There would be too many wild animals for you. I will drive them out ahead of you little by little. I will do it until your numbers have increased enough for you to take control of the land. I will make your borders secure from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. They will go from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will hand over to you the people who live in the land. You will drive them out to make room for you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land. If you do, they will cause you to sin against me. If you worship their gods, they will certainly be a trap for you. Now often God will tell them to go in and completely wipe these people out. God's not being an extremely mean God, anything like that. Often there are exceptions that were to be made. Rahab is an example. Also Ruth was originally a Moabitess and she became part of Israel as well. If a person were to separate themselves from their previous culture, from their worshipping of false gods, and accept the one true God, to make him their God, then God would bring them into the fold. They would be one of the Israelites. That's perfectly acceptable. When God says completely destroy them, he's not talking about the individual so much as he is the culture, the idolatry, the wickedness that they were doing. That is what they were supposed to completely destroy. Well, that's it for commentary on Exodus chapter 23. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you guys next time.